Siona Gardaman, we to your lega, Gale and lega, de tillet, cause the he a deal. Or degally scared to like Gant Dowdo. Do you have a deal, um, Usti, digging a walking the soy do don't our tassy dollar. Now the lena he to skunk and her, Sudan nail squint, only foreman Sudan nail. No lay no jig teleports in nail, he was the gagger. To let Gaboni hist, and it was says, dig a lost darnay. To let Gaboni hist, Junda Nilage. Unadol Hursa, Ugan with you, son. Dig it, dig a lost dark, they nigger than a home spoon. My name is Wade. I, um, I live here in Tahlequah. I'm from up north and I work for the Cherokee Language Department. I am a, a manager for Cherokee Language Program. And and we have some other pilot programs under our belt too. Kristen's a supervisor for that program, so thank you for facilitating for us today. Um, I'm a dork. Um, I'll warn you firsthand. So language is something I've been in love with for a long time. When we started our Master Apprentice program about five or six years ago, my language grew dramatically. And in that process, um, I, I learned a lot about our language. I'm still learning. I'm talented. Uh, I'm learning my second language, Cherokee, um, I'm a second language learner. So I'm, I'm happy to be here to talk to you and um, hopefully I will be able to share some interesting things for you. So some of the things that I found along my journey about how Cherokee is a little bit different than English. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and, um, and we'll get into it. I'm very, very excited to be able to share this information with you. And if you have any questions, be sure and type them in the chat and I will probably put notes in the chat as well. So um, the very first thing here are some really important Cherokee words, OCO or just CO and Tohizu. Now, when I was uh, a little kid, I didn't hear OCO. I heard CO and Tohizu. And when I came home to my family and let them know I was learning Cherokee in school, they said, talk Cherokee to me. I said, OCO, Tohiju. And they just laughed at me. And they said, that's not how we say it. So they're different dialects. Um, I'm just kind of using a standard dialect here. What I want to point out is um, OCO probably comes from the word OC. And OC is just basically the, the root word for good. So I'm typing that in the chat. Um, you can say good different ways in Cherokee, but Olsi is, is uh, one of the ways you can say it. Another way that people say good is Olsi. And it probably comes from this longer way of saying it, Olsi da. Now, Olsi by itself just means good, but when you put that da on the end, that's an affirmative. That can be used as an exclamation mark. Um, it's also like adding the word yes to a word. So in Cherokee, we don't have to use punctuation marks because we have little suffixes that get added onto the word that lets you know about what punctuation would do for English. In the immersion school, we do teach punctuation so kids learn how to use punctuation for English one day. It gets their mind ready for that. But you'll see here on my um, slide that I'm using punctuation to alter some sounds. So I put that comma after the O to let you know that OCO is not how a lot of people say it. They just shorten it to CO. So that lets you know a vowel is dropped out. And you see Tohiju is spelled do he ju, but I put a little period by that do to let you know that it's pronounced with a T as an alternative consonant. Tohiju. So you can alter this OC, which means good to turn it into all see down, yes, good, or affirmative good. And when you shorten that, what it turns into is all stuff. And people will shorten it even more to just all. And that's a lot of times how people say good. You can say all see do. And that means, are you good? The do on the end is a polite or rhetorical question. It's like you already guessed the answer. People don't even have to answer it. It's like you've assumed the answer is positive or yes. So if you cut off the first part of this word, I'll see you, um, and you just have this ju on the end, and sometimes it's pronounced jaw, 
just different different ways of pronouncing it in different places. But Jew is generally how we write it. The written form is a little more standardized than the spoken form. This Jew is that question part of the word. It's a polite or weak question. And if you put tohi on the front, now tohi by itself means wellness or health. So when you add the Jew to the tohi, you get a question. Tohi or tohi is how my family said it. Tohi is basically asking if you're well. And the assumed answer is yes. You can change this. You can put that da on the end of tohi also for your answer. Tohi da, that means yes, good. Oops, autocorrect. Let me try that again. Tohi da. It wants tohids. Um, let's see if it'll let me do it. No. There we go. Tohi da. Now, another alternative is a gwu on the end. It means just or only or still. And gwu by itself can be spelled with a G W U, or you could spell it with a Q U. You. Either way, it has the same meaning. Um, the phonetics that people use are different from place to place. In Cherokee, we use the character gwu to represent that. And sometimes, oddly enough, gwu is pronounced woo with just a W sound. Let's see if I can get it to do that for me. So, so you don't have to say tohi gwu, you could just say tohi wu, and that means I'm just fine. To, but when you spell it, it's generally spelled with a gwu, tohi gwu. A lot of people don't pronounce that G. So that's one of the issues that we find in Cherokee. You can also say si wu or si gwu for just good. There are a lot of different ways to communicate in Cherokee. You can say si zu, which means are you good? si tohi ju, are you well? You could say all see all Yes, I'm good. All tohi dun. Yes, I'm well. You could also ask tohi wu which is that gu and that ju. And you can answer it tohi wu dun. So you can mix and match these endings. It's a lot like Legos. That's how this language works. It's built piece by piece. It has a root meaning, and then you add suffixes or affixes to it. Uh, prefixes, suffixes. Things that go on both sides called circumfixes change the meaning. And then we have things that pop in the middle of the word called infixes. So Cherokee is full of all these little additions. And that's one of the reasons why it's challenging. So let's um, go to the next slide. Anitzaleg. Now you can pronounce it anitzalegi. A lot of people do. Anitzalegi is, is fine, but um, anitzaleg, is, is how a lot of people say it. So you'll find differences in vowel pronunciation and that can be very frustrating. But when you spell it in its simplest form, it's ani talagi. Um, the ani on the front means they are. If you wanna say he or she is Cherokee, it's, on, it's just a talak or a talagi. Now you'll find that in most situations in spoken Cherokee, the final vowel is dropped. So a talak, is the more conversational way to say atalagi or atalag. So atalak or atalag means he or she is Cherokee. That a at the front lets you know that you're talking about a, a human being. If you just say the word talak or talag, then um, then you are not um, you're not talking about a human. You're either using that to describe something like talak talija, a Cherokee basket, talak dudo, the Cherokee name. Or you can use it as a noun, just chalak by itself would be either the Cherokee language or culture. But to talk about a human being, you have to put a pronoun on the front, and that's a. Now, a chalak is a Cherokee person, but ani chalak, when you drop an ni in there after that a, ani, that adds the meaning of being plural. So that means they are Cherokee. Ani chalak, they are Cherokee. It's not the only word for it. People think that on the Tlaq um, is probably from the word Tlaqi, which is the Choctaw word for people that live in holes in the ground or grave people. It could also be from the Creek word Estichlaqi or Estichlaqolgi, which means people that talk funny or talk different. All the people in the Southeast where our ancestors were from originally 
Um, they spoke either a Siouan language or more often than that, the Muscogean language family, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, or Seminole, and there were others. There were some isolates like Yuchi and Nachi, but we were the only ones that spoke an Iroquoian language. You could call it a, a Chalukian language if you want, but it's part of a larger family of languages that include the language families that the Haudenosaunee speakers have, like um, Seneca, um, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Mohawk. So we're language, our language is closely related to theirs. And I say that it's been about 2,000 to 3,000 years since we've shared the same language. But in the Southeast, we were the ones that spoke differently. Let's see if I can get it to click to the next one. Onigaduwak. Now this word gaduwak, um, it comes from the word gaduwa. And I didn't get to listen to, to, to Croslin's um, president, but you did. And he may have said something different, but I've heard different things from different elders. So we don't know exactly where this word Kaduwa comes from. Uh, we have ideas based upon our oral traditions, and they're different in different families. Different people believe different things, and it's been passed down through the generations in their families. And, you know, we can look at it linguistically. Gidu won't eat. Uh, means to be on top of. So it might be referring to an island that we came from. It also is related to this word, which means the very uppermost. And that could be in the image of the creator that we were, that we were created in. Gadua is also the name of an ancient mound that was back east outside of Bryson City, North Carolina today. They say that was our mother town the first place the Cherokees were from. And if you go there, there's a mound that's been farmed for about 500 years. That's finally in the possession of, of our Eastern brand relatives and they share it with us. And this is a sacred site for us. And I recommend everybody go to Gadua. That's where we're from. Now, when you put Gadua Gi on there, that GI, it can do a couple of different things. But one of the things that it often does is it turns verbs into nouns, like a gerund. So Gadua Gi could be like katuas. And you can spell this with an A, kaduwa, kaduwa gi, katuas. Now the difference is, um, is that gadu is on top. Well, gadu is bread, gadu is bread, but gadu is on top. Let me say it right, you gotta get your tones right. You gotta sing this language right. Gadu is bread, but gadu is on top. And you can see they're related. Gadu huska is something that, that's baking. So gadu, gadu huska, somebody's baking bread. Gadu is on top. Gadu sa'i is on top of the hill. So gadu could be the root of this word, gadu wagi. That could be the original value of this meaning. Um, but when you put the ani in front, when you when you add the, the a by itself, like a gadu wa. The agadu wagi means he or she is a to a person. If you say ani gadu wagi, that means they are Katua people. So there are three different groups of Cherokees that use this name to describe themselves. First and foremost that we're familiar with are these folks like uh, in the picture here. This is taken at, at Redbird Smith ceremonial ground before they moved it to Stokes. Stokes is the main ceremonial ground a lot of Cherokees go to, and Stokes was actually Redbird's youngest son. And you see Stokes in that picture there, he's kind of front and center. And these folks are ceremonial people, our traditional people, they call themselves Amigadu Wagi. They'll say, Jigadu Wak. They'll say, that's what I am, Jigadu Wak. They put that a lot of times before Cherokee. Also, there's another federally recognized group of Cherokees called the United Katua Band of Cherokee Indians in Oklahoma. Katuas for short, or United Katua Band, UKB. And these folks, you have to be a quarter or more Cherokee to be a member. They do have their own roles, but they allow Cherokee Nation members to um, disenroll and join the United Katua Band. And, um, and they consider themselves to be more traditional as well, but, but they also have a lot of Baptist folks in there. So for them, it's less about religion, less about ceremony, more about uh, a biological identity associated with blood quantum. And, and what we know is that our, our people that have higher blood quantum, our Cherokees that have higher blood quantum, 
um, have ancestors that had to rely on Cherokee culture to survive. And so, so higher blood quantum Cherokees are indeed more likely to have more of the language and more of the culture in their families. So it, it kind of makes sense that sometimes people consider the United Katua Band to be the more traditional group. But there's a third group, and that's the Eastern Band, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And they speak the Kadua dialect. In Oklahoma, we speak Odal dialect, which means overhill. Odal by itself really means mountain, but Odal dialect is translated as a overhill dialect. The Eastern Band, they speak the Kadua dialect for the most part, especially around Kuala. There's some folks around Snowbird and Robbinsville that, that speak a, an overhill dialect like us, but even they sound a lot like the, the other Eastern Band folks that speak the Kadua dialect. The third dialect is no longer with us. There were some folks that spoke uh, words from that dialect uh, that, that were alive about 10 to 20 years ago, but um, it's hard to find anybody that uses any of those words from that lower dialect. They call it. Now in the lower dialect, you use R's instead of L's, so they would have called it Eradi, and it's possible Chalagi used to be Charagi when they were speaking to folks from the lower dialect, so that, that could be a, an association with the modern word Cherokee. On the Yawi, or just on the Yawi. Now, that final vowel is really dropped. So on the Yawi, when you say that, you need your tone to come up and that E needs to be pronounced. What's interesting about this word is that on the Yawi is, um, is used a lot of times to mean principal people in documents. So if you read about Cherokees academically, they'll say that this is our original name. However, our elders tell us Onigaduwak is probably our original name, where Onigawi means Indians. So just if you say Yawi by itself, that means, he, that means person, human being. And again, the final vowel is dropped. So more often than not, you're going to hear Ya. That V makes an A uh sound, Ya. Um, he or she is a person, is a Ya. So that's, that's how you turn them really into a human being. You could have young that are associated with mythological beings, spiritual beings, non-human people. Um, however, ah young, if you put that ah on there, you're definitely talking about a human being. And if you wanna make it plural, people, on the young is what you call humans or people, on the young. That on the makes it plural. Now on the by itself is strawberry. On the is here. But when you attach it to the front of the word, that acts like they, plural, third person, on the young. Now, on the young, if you add the ya at the end, so I'm going to type it out the long way, on the young, we ya, that's Indians. But that, again, that final a at the end is really not pronounced. So that means that you really have to pronounce the i sound on the young, we to make sure that, that that Y is captured in there. That Ya at the end means most prominent, most numerous. Um, it could be principal people, but when modern Cherokee speakers use this term, Honiyawi, they don't just mean Cherokees, they mean other Indians as well. When I first started working uh, for the Cultural Resource Center, I did a lot of time with the emergent school teachers when they were first developing that curriculum. And they said, Wade, you speak good English. Why don't you come over here and help us with some English? So that's what I did. We were translating past standards into Cherokee, Oklahoma past standards, um, kind of like common core standards, but they were, you know, about a decade before then. And they said that, you know, in third grade, these learners need to understand the opposite, this word opposite, the opposite of good is bad and so on and so forth. And so I asked the speakers, I said, you know what opposite means? I said, what's the opposite of up? And they said, down. What's the opposite of black? And they said, white. What's the opposite of happy? They said, sad. I said, see, that's what it means. It works that way in Cherokee. And they said, no, it doesn't. The opposite of black in Cherokee is not white. We have a different word for everything. And each word defines itself. In the Western way of thinking, starting all the way back to Greek philosophers, spreading up through the, the Roman empire out through Western Europe. Eventually folks hopped on a boat, came over here and spread these ideas here is that words are really ultimately defined by their opposites. In Cherokee, it's just not that way. 
So when I pointed out this on Dietla word in the Cherokee dictionary and said, this is the word for opposite, they laughed at me. And they said, that's like somebody on the other side of the road or somebody on the other side of the river. It really is just describing positionality. It's not describing something that's deeper. So in Cherokee, each word has its own value. In English, we're highly influenced by uh, Western thinking. Another example of that is this word, Kaliwon. It was, the, I don't know if it was that same day or a different day when I was working with the immersion teachers and we were translating past standards, but the kids are expected to learn this idea of perfect. And I said, there's definitely a Cherokee word for perfect. It's even in the New Testament. Kaliwohi. There's another word, Kaliwosa. But Kaliwohi or Kaliwosa was the word that was associated with perfect or perfection. And they said it's not the same. Well, from a Western perspective, you go all the way back to the Greek philosophers, and there was a a Greek down to this concept of non-physical. So platonic love is non-physical love. So Plato believed that the truest form of anything was not its physical form, but it was its idea form or ideal form. Idea and ideal are related etymologically. So Plato believed that the true things that existed in the universe didn't exist physically, but existed in something called the ether. And the ether was like a mix between collective consciousness and heaven. So an artist that wanted to make a, a perfect statue would envision this statue in the ether. And then they would create it here on earth. And another artist that wanted to envision a perfect statue, a different artist might tap into that same image in the ether. But when that different artist created it here on earth, they would create a different work of art because the ether is always the same, but the physical is changing and it's imperfect. So perfection was related to something that didn't change. And so it really defines a lot of our thinking, especially over here in the Western world, when we speak in English. But this Cherokee word, kali, by itself means full. Kali wohi means completely full. So anything that does its fullest potential, that meets its fullest potential could be kali wohi. You could take an empty glass of water and fill it full and it would become kali wohi. You could take a drink of that water and it would no longer be Kaliwohi. You could even take an empty glass, hold it upside down and see that its potential is to store water and say that that glass is doing what it's supposed to do, even though it might not have water in it, it has its perfect potential, Kaliwohi. But a human being is, is not perfect until they die. So we are constantly changing. Here's another really nice word, I think. Um, so adagehti, I think is what this word is. I got my chat in the way. Oops, let me see if I can turn that back. Hold on a sec, here we go. Um, yeah, this is adagehti, and that's the, the Cherokee word to love. It means for one to love another. Ageyuti, agehti, adagehti. This is a very important value. When I say Kristen to gay you, it does mean I love Kristen, who will hop to gay you, but it doesn't mean that, that I love her necessarily like a wife because she's married and happily married. She's an amazing coworker. We work together on a lot of things and, and I appreciate her and, and I value her and I value her well being. So when I say Kristen to gay you, it means that I don't want somebody to use her up, I don't want somebody to hurt her. I want to conserve her well-being. I want to protect her. I'm stingy with her. I don't let other people run her down or tear her up. Uh, I try to take good care of her because she really adds a lot of value to my world and my life, and I have a personal connection with her. She's a great coworker, so I can say that honestly, Kristen, to gay you. But it really comes down to the word for stingy. Gay, gay you is is the root of the word for stingy. So there's an old teaching that is um, de da da gay you say sti. Let me see, gay you say sti. Yeah, here it is. Let me put it phonetics. De da da gay you say sti. And it has that gay you right in the middle. And that's the heart of the word. 
Every Cherokee verb has four parts. This first part, the day tada, means y'all to each other. That's the who's doing it. And it's a command. Okay, you is the stingy part. This sasty at the end, it's telling you two different things. It actually has two different parts, and I'm not going to go into that. But it tells you how in time it's happening and when. So the when is the future and the how is the command. Dates a dog gay you say SD. And part of that is tone. It has to go up in tone. And that is basically me extolling all of you to be stingy with one another. And it does mean love, but but it's a very specific kind of love. And um, I wanted to learn I love you, gay you, so I could talk to my grandma. And gay you. It has a he on the end, but hardly anybody ever pronounces that I. Gagayu or gagayu e. That ga on the front, that just GV sound, that means me to you. So this means me to you, I'm stingy. I'm stingy with you. Grandma, because every time I would hug her, I would say, I love you. And she would just say, uh, which means yes. And um, and so I thought if I say it in Cherokee, maybe she'll say it back. So I said, gagayu, Elise, and she just said, uh. Turns out that speakers don't say this very much because love is something you show up. It's not something you talk about. Gay you really just means I'm stingy with you. Um, the value of love is, is what you do for people, how, how you treat them. So um, did I go backwards? No, I did not. Um, somebody tell me what this word is because my chat's in the way and I can't see it. I think it's... Um, I don't. Oh, heart. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Mary. Udant. Udanton. Now, Udanto is far out. See, I talked to a couple elders about this, and, and they agreed with me, but it's far out. So so follow me on this, because um, unless unless you got somebody back you up, sometimes it's hard to it's hard to go with. So Udanado is how it's fully spelled. Udanado. He, but the final I is not pronounced. Udon, na don. And the root of this word is na don. Now, na don, as most of you know, is the word for sun or moon. Now, sun is ig a nud or nud ig a, which means the solar body that exists in the day, where moon is us a nud or nud us a, which is the basically the sun at night. But nud is the sun. Nud is the sun or the moon. So it's also the heart of this word, udan to is how it's pronounced, udan to. Uda is one, one's to another. So I could say, oh, to, that's, that's my heart. But that da in there means me for another. So it's not just my heart for me, it's my heart for others. Awadan to. Udan to is someone else's heart for another's. Jadan to is your, your heart for others. So the root of this is the sun. So the sun was the heart of our universe. That's the idea. The sun was the heart of our universe. Everything rotated around the sun. Even the moon rotated around us. So the sun was the heart of creation in the heavens in the daytime. And the moon was the heart of creation in the heavens at night. So the word heart comes from the word sun. Awadanto is my heart. But if I say... If I say it a little bit different and I say, I want to, I want, I want to, that's what it is, I want to, that means I know something. If somebody knows something, it's un ta. If you know somebody, something, it's John ta. So the word for knowing something also comes from this word. It, so does the word for feeling. Ost, I would don't, means I feel good. Ost, don't, you feel good. And even the word friendly comes from the same word. Udant do he udanti, that means somebody is certainly very kind, big hearted, compassionate. So these meanings are, are sometimes very, very deep. Didatini don. So there are different types of leaders in Cherokee. Ayan li don, he is a leader at the ceremonial ground, somebody that leads in our stomp dance songs. But didatini don is something a little bit more than that. What it means is that you basically take somebody by the hand and you guide them. 
You guide them around from place to place. A leader isn't the one that stands up front and takes all the credit. They're the one that guides you. To be a good leader means to be somebody that people want to follow. If they're not following you physically, they need to, they need to follow your ideas. They need to follow your values. Because you have to be somebody that people want to follow. That's what leadership is from a Cherokee perspective. And that's what this idea means, that you take somebody by the hand and, and you bring them along with you. So you don't wanna to get too far ahead. You don't wanna let them get too far behind. It's about relationships. So here's a word that's a lot of fun. So we have these different forms in Cherokee. I can say, Tzitzalek, I'm Cherokee. Hitzalek, you're Cherokee. Odzalek, he or she is Cherokee. Those are three changes at the front of the words. G, he, and ah. Zitzalak, I'm Cherokee. Hitzalak, you're Cherokee. Ajalak, someone else is Cherokee. That's three out of the 10 that that word can change. Three, 10 ways, three out of the 10 ways that word can change. You can also say me and you are Cherokee. Me and you two are Cherokee. Stitzalak. I can say me and another are Cherokee. Oh, Stitzalak. I can say, those are all the duels. Those all have to do with two people. He needs a lock, steeds a lock, all steeds a lock. Those are all duels. And the last four of these 10 are plurals. I need a lock, they are Cherokee. Not me, not you. We might be, but we're talking about them. I need a lock. Then we have eeds a lock, that means y'all. Old seeds a lock, that's us. Not necessarily you. Old seeds a lock, it could be you, but I'm not talking about you. Old seeds a lock. And then we have eeds a lock. And that's all of this, me, you, and at least one other person. It's plural, not just dual. So the word for friend doesn't have a singular form. I can't say, I'm a friend. I have to be a friend to somebody. And when I say, oh, I'm saying I'm a friend to somebody else. It doesn't mean I'm a friend of the person I'm speaking to. That O on the front excludes the person I'm speaking to. If I wanna tell that person I'm talking to, me and you are friends, so if I'm telling you personally, we're friends, I say, Ginali. Oh, Ginali is somebody else. Ginali is me and you. I could say, Stali, for you two are friends. Idzali, y'all are friends. Odzali, I guess it would be, Ogali is us, we're friends. Igali is you, me, and others. So there are different plural and dual ways to say friend, but we don't have friend just by itself. So when I say my friend and I'm talking about him, I say, oh, Ginali. So when I'm talking to you, I say, Ginali. What's funny is just like the word gageyu, this word is not very often used by speakers. Ginali, you are my friend, should be understood. And if you have to tell somebody that you're their friend, a lot of times um, they doubt that. So this is not used nearly as commonly in Cherokee as it is in English. Here's a really cool word, agayan, agayan lage. So the word for first in Cherokee is agayin. That's the concept of first. That's the concept of first. A person that's first is agayan. Let's see, agayin. I can't type agayin. There. That means either she or he is first. It has an awe on the front. That's the same awe that you have on Adzalag, Agaduwag, Ayel. All that awe on the front is either she or he. So Agani is first. Agayali. 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 Is old. But not old in an insult. That's the way. That's trash. You throw that stuff away. This. Um, well, I misspelled it. Uh, there we go. That's the old word, sorry. Old or ancient. But it's a positive kind of old. It's like a really valuable antique, something that you hang on to nearly. And it comes from that word first. A gayan is also the word for a thousand. So something that's a thousand years old is a gayan. It's old as crap. So agayelage is the word for old woman. But you can see how it is not related to something bad, but related to something that is first, primary, 
an heirloom of deep seated value. People don't do what they're supposed to do in Cherokee communities because they're afraid of the cops. They don't do what they're supposed to do to earn a paycheck. They do what they're supposed to do because they're thinking of their grandma. They're thinking of the old women in their family and they don't want to disappoint them. Until they develop enough self-initiative to do things for the right reasons, a lot of times our young people do things out of respect for their elders, out of appreciation for their elders. And those old women run the families. They are primary. So that's, that's the value of an old woman in Cherokee society. It means a lot more than somebody that's just old. They're primary. So this Dide Yote, that means to teach. And we ran into this problem. Um, I was saying, oops, oops, uh -huh. Sorry about that, guys. Um, we ran into this issue. How do you say teacher? And it's Dide Yohask, somebody who teaches. And I'll type that, Dide Yo, uh, it has an E at the end, people don't pronounce the E. Ide Yo Husk. It comes from the word Squayo Haga. Squayo Haga means to teach me. Teach me. It's, it's a request, it's an imperative. Squayo Haga, teach me. But really, what it means is show me. It doesn't mean lecture to me, it doesn't mean talk to me about it, it means demonstrate it to me. So teaching from a Cherokee perspective is both about leadership, that that idea of taking someone by the hand and guiding them. And it's also about this show me, teach me, direct me in a way where I can see it, demonstrate it to me. So this is a little bit different than somebody preaching at you. This is somebody that is taking you by the hand and showing you how to do things developing your skills. So it's a, it's a different value. Now, diyukta is also very, very important. Now, when you see it spelled, it's spelled do you go tongue. But um, as you know, a lot of Cherokee sounds are, are, are dropped out of our really common words. The more common the word, a lot of times, the more likely it is to be abbreviated. But when you spell it out, it's do you go tongue. Nobody says it that way. They shorten it to the U K T, and that D kind of turns into a T sound when you drop that vowel off of the go. So the U K T could mean the way or the truth. And when I talk to some of the elders, they say that this word go T is our word for fire. Our word for fire is um, probably the root of this word for truth. Just like the sun was the heart of creation in the heavens, every community had its heart. Every important event used to take place around a central ceremonial location. And that was the place where our living fire dwelt, our sacred fire dwelt. And so all important events took place there. The council house that held that fire or the square ground where that fire was kept was the host for major community events. It was like it was like a church mixed with a city hall, mixed with a community building, all together. That's where everything important took place with that fire right there. And the idea was that smoke carries our prayers up. And so it was like God was witnessing what we were doing. So fire was really important. And for that community, the fire was its heart. So the heart of the heavens was the sun, but the heart of creation here on earth was the fire. So it's likely that this word diyukta is related to that. Now you can also say diyukta, which has almost the same spelling. And that means straight, like straight and narrow, like a pin, like a needle going straight or an arrow going straight. Diyukta. Diyu is our word for boats, like our old dugout canoes that would go up and down the rivers, straight this way or straight that way. They weren't they didn't have rudders. They were big, long dugout canoes. So they went straight. So that's our word for boat, ziyu. Ziyu amaido, which means it goes about on the water, or ziyu akawidist, it means it flies in the heavens, or pardon me, it takes off, a boat that takes off. Or you could say ziyu ganohilido, it's a boat that flies, and you can guess that that would be an airplane. So all of these ideas have to do with 
what is right, what is true, to yukta. So that is the way and the truth. A lot of Plains Indians talk about the red path. They talk about the red way, the Indian way, the red way. And for us, red is gig. Gig is the color of, well, gig is blood. And I'll just write gig here for blood. Gig is um, the color of blood. So, so red is the color of blood. The red path for us is the path of war, which is a potential path for victory. It's certainly a conflict-oriented path. The white path is not. The white path is referred to as this diyukta, and it's the way and the truth, the way that we're supposed to live, to think right and do right. And there's a lot to that. And you see that guy hold these belts, and these belts teach about that. And I'm not qualified to teach about these belts here, but, but I can tell you that diyukta is represented by our old teachings. It's represented by what our ancestors did around those ceremonial fires and what they did when they went home. And it's not just in how we treat people, but also in how we think about people and how we talk about people. It's the right way to live. And it's in alignment with religions. Basically, if you act right and think right, and you know what that is, then you're following this, the yukta. You're following this path. I don't know if I'm clicking out or not. Okay, so we got a couple of words for thinking. Wadon is how we say it in Odal dialect, Overhill dialect. I'll go ahead and write Overhill for you guys so you have it. Overhill is Odal. That also means a mountain. Odal means mountain, but we call it Overhill dialect, Odal. Um, even before we moved on the, on the Trail of Tears, even before the removal, we have had people that have documented our language. And there's an old document from 1710, I believe. Alexander Long documented this in a lexicon. And it had basically a bizarre spelling for this word, but don't. And it was used for thank you. He, he got it from an overhill town. And so those were the folks that spoke the dialect that a lot of folks here in Oklahoma speak. So this overhill dialect has used Wado for at least 300 years. So it's really similar to the Creek word, madon. And anybody that studies linguistics will probably tell you that it comes from this Creek word for thank you, madon. But it's not something we picked up after the removal. It's something that we've had a long time. All throughout the Southeast, there were these trade routes and everybody traded with each other. And our language is hard. And Creeks didn't want to learn to cher speak Cherokee. Choctaws didn't want to learn to speak Cherokee. Nobody wanted to learn to speak Cherokee. They didn't want to have to learn each other's languages. So we had a trade language that's called Mobilian today. Uh, there was a group, there was a tribe of Muscogean speakers, Creek speakers that lived around Mobile, Alabama. That's what that tribe was named, Mobile. And, and their language was used as the trade language throughout the Southeast. So it's likely that we developed Wado from them. So what did we use before Wado? Now in the Eastern band, they use Shki. Now, I spell it funny here, S-H-K-I, because um, that's kind of how it's pronounced. But if you look in the chat, the way they spell it is S-G-I. That's how it is in phonetics. Shki. And that's the Eastern band style. Right? In Oklahoma, we'll say shki, short for uh, shki, which I'll type that out. Uh, shki or uh, shkida means yes, really. Shkigi means really. Shkida means yes, really. You hear that do on the end? That's that affirmative. That's that S when you add yes to a word. Uh, shkida, yes, really. Shkigi, really. If you say uh, shki, that means that's it. Uh, shki. And if you just shorten it to shki, it still means that's it when you speak in the overhill dialect. But for folks in North Carolina, that's how they acknowledge thank you. Shki. And it's not wrong. It's just a different use of the same idea. Chances are, you know, that's probably what we said if we wanted to acknowledge something. Somebody gave us, a, I don't know, dinner or something, you know, just something small would say ski, we would acknowledge that. We would acknowledge that appreciation. But, but we have another word that, that we use when it's deeper. And, and that's, um, well, this is me to you all. So, so not only are there 10 pronouns, me, you, and another, 
me and you, you two, me and another, y'all, us, not you, all of us, and they, those are 10. We also have another 62 on top of that. So 72 total. Ga, like as in ga, gay you is me to you. Ijayalilites means me to y'all. Me to y'all. So there's a batch of these and you're not gonna learn them in a day. But, um, but that ij on the front of this word, um, if you just say easy by itself, um, that means y'all. Easy by itself on the front, of, you have to have, have it attached to a word. But that, that's how you, oops, sorry, Rodney, I didn't mean to just send that to you. I meant that for everybody. Bad habit. I don't know how to, I don't know how to take that back. I guess you guys will have to listen to me. Um, Gale e liga means I'm happy. Gale e liga, let me say it right. Gale e liga means I'm happy. If I say, Ziyale e liga, I'm happy about someone. But if I say, Ziyale e litis, that means I'm happy for what somebody did. Ziyale e litis. So I can say, Kristen, Ziyale e litis, I'm happy. But if I want to say, I'm happy to you or for what you did, I'm thankful to you, I could say, Ziyale e That's that same guz in Gagayu. But when I say y'all, it has to be So this word thank you or thankful comes from the word happy. Uli heli state celebrate something. They all have the same root meaning. So if you want to be happy from a Cherokee perspective, you have to be thankful. So thank you all. For listening to this presentation. Um, that said, um, I have this little thing at the end here. You can read that if you want. I just thought it was valuable. I just thought it was valuable because, you know, culture is the heart of our language. Our language and our culture go together hand in hand. They cannot survive without one another. And in immersion settings, you learn word replacement. I could hold something up like uh, this pencil and say, he uh, dig a well old thing, dig a well old thing, dig a well old thing, dig a well old thing has two words. And you would say, this is a pencil. But what you don't know, unless you know the root meaning, is it's the thing that you use to write with. Go well is writing. Dig a well or writings. Dig a well old adult is the thing that you use to write with. So it means more than a pencil. So even in immersion sessions, you just learn the English version of things. And if you're just memorizing word lists, you're just memorizing word lists and you can't use it in context. The real meaning of the language is tied to its culture. And so that's why I wanted to add this little slide here at the end. And I'm sure they will give you copies of this presentation if you request them. That said, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, and see if anybody has any questions. Please pronounce D da de D D de Hyo Ting. D D de Hyo Ting. Oh, that's that has an E at the end. Sorry. D D de Hyo Ting. Didi de Yohi. Didi de Yohi. There it is. Didi de Yohi. Gotta get the tone right. Didi de Yohi. Yeah, but don't. Didi de Yohi. It looks like the word uh, teach, but it's, it's not quite the same word, is it? You wanna tell us what it is, Frank? I like it. Yeah, he pointed out it's to play marbles. Are there any other other questions? Uh, Kristen says that I get kind of thorough. Definitely not a uh, 
not a bad thing by by any means whatsoever. Uh, what a Judy says that this is really interesting, and she has a lot to learn, as do we all, Judy. That will that will never ever change. And sometimes you'll even hear um, Wad say that he too has <laughs> lots of things to learn as well. Oh, absolutely. There's something I learned more recently, and that's this word "ale." As you guys probably know, if you study the language, "ale" is used for and or possibly or. Now, if you ask or as a question, it's a suffix ke at the end, like kahwa ke, do you want coffee or not? Not, sorry, my English is bad. Kahwi ke means coffee or not. With a question, it's that ke that makes it a question. But that's a different kind of or. So when you when you say ale, that's like in addition to. So we have this word nudale, which means different. What it means is it in respect to other things is in addition to. So it's not different in a negative context. Text. It's different. It's, it doesn't take away. It adds to. Ale is the, the add to idea. New delay. So um, so there there's a lot of different things that we're learning. One of them is this word. Usti. Now if you say it if you say it with an H, usti, usti. It's it's baby. Sometimes people don't say it with an H, but they'll make a a a rising tone, usti, usti, and that's still baby. But usti, when you say it flat, means little. But when you say gada usti, which means what is it? It doesn't mean baby and it doesn't mean little. It means, um, and well, it comes from the same word as some. So if you guys have studied the language, you know go husti is some. But it's only something physical. So, so some of our physical things have different words than non-physical things. Sorry about that. So the the something physical is is gohusti. But if it's non-physical, like an idea or a verb, then that is the word. New sting. So when you ask what something is, could the new sting? You're asking for its non physical essence. What is this thing? Keep it down out there. You say, it's the way, or to needs a dunty, or to needs a dunty. You can say it like that. To <laughs> it means peace and wellness, it means health, but it also means chill. <laughs> so at the emergency school, we say, "Come, Paul hates a darn thing. Calm down, relax." Usti yon um, translated, although I did that recording a long time ago. Um, it's hard for me to remember exactly the words, but I know it has to do with um, writing. I can't remember the words right now. I'm sorry. Um, if you type them up, I'll translate it. Star Wars is um, da nu, da nu we, or da nu wa. It really doesn't matter because that final vowel is silent. Da nu is the word for war. Da nu no sing. That's that star. Or you can or you can switch them and say no xi da nu. And that, what do we have another question as well? Um, someone yeah. is asking. I've I've missed your your name um, by now. Lots of lots of good things going on here. Um, so Antoinette would like to know what do you think about flashcards in terms of learning the syllabary. I think they're great. Um, I think that you know if you learn the syllabary, it opens up access to all these written documents because Cherokee is primarily writing syllabary as opposed to phonetics. 
And so syllabary is necessary in that regard. Obviously the syllabary doesn't capture all the sounds in Cherokee. There are a lot of sounds in the syllabary that are not pronounced in spoken Cherokee. So we developed a system to help our learners, but still yet syllabary is absolutely, absolutely valuable. Um, the best way to probably learn it is line by line and uh, write it while you say it and then use syllabary uh, flashcards to, to help you and just add a couple more in here and there and if you can find words associated with these syllabary characters that way you have context it's not just learning symbols and sounds without context you it really helps to have words to go with these with these symbols and sounds and that helps weave the neurons in your brain together. And that really helps you with retention. So I think flashcards are, are a key part of that, but be sure and, and put it to words as well. Oh no, all my stuff in the messages isn't going to everybody. Look at that, dagnabbit. So um, I keep sending them to Rodney on accident. Sorry, Rodney. Rodney's gonna give this presentation for us next time. It's going to be so well informed. Uh, um, we do have uh, we do have one more um, one more question, and this might actually be our our last question. And what I'll give you a few seconds if you want to jot those translations back yeah. into, um, into the chat. Vicky Davis um, would like to know if there are any additional resources that you suggest for expanding someone's knowledge on Cherokee etymology. Yeah, Durban Feeling's dictionary, Durban Feeling and Pulte dictionary, it's probably your best source. It's the easiest to wade through. And um, and it has the, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily draw easy pictures for you when it comes to etymology, but, um, but what it does is it shows you the patterns and you can draw, you can draw, um, your own conclusions from those patterns. And those patterns are accurate and they're high quality. And um, we miss Durbin Chagesa, he passed away about a year ago last week. And he was a genius and he was, a, he was a, not just a native speaker, but he was also, man, my typos keep getting, he was also a, a linguist. So that's probably the best resource. And then of course the online classes, Ed Fields teaches, etymology on accident and um, and and he he throws a lot of culture in there with those so you can go to cherokee.org and get those And um, thanks to everyone else for being here this afternoon for us. I believe we've answered all of the questions that have been in the chat. Everything else has been just um, a lot of gratitude for your um, sharing your knowledge today. And we're always so thankful for that. I have the privilege of spending most days with Wade. And so he's, he's very, very giving in his, in his knowledge. And we thank him for taking some time to put together this wonderful presentation and share with us this afternoon. So thank you for being here, everyone. And um, hope you've had a enjoyable experience. I know we definitely wish that we could be face-to-face -face and enjoy one another's company. And it's the one, one time of the year that we really get to do that. And hopefully, hopefully we can next year, but until that time, um, stay safe, keep your families safe, and we'll see you all soon. What up? I don't, I don't. <laughs>